Welcome everybody. Uh, my name is Erin Stevens. I am the Philanthropy Manager with the International Elephant Project. Uh, thank you for joining our webinar this evening where we will be meeting Dr. Alex Mossbrooker, Field Manager for the International Elephant Project, who will be discussing his new book, Island Elephants, the Giants of Sumatra. Joining us shortly will be Leif Cox, founder of the International Elephant Project, who will introduce Alex. But firstly, I'll just give you a brief uh, introduction to the International Elephant Project, or IEP as we call it, and our conservation achievements over the past year. IEP was established in 2015 to protect and conserve wild populations of elephants and their rainforest habitat. The organisation provides technical and financial assistance to on-ground projects in Sumatra, Borneo, Malaysia and Laos. And thanks to the generosity of our donors in 2021, we were able to rescue, release and uh, rescue and release 67 elephants, protect 525 wild elephants, employ 69 wildlife rangers and protect over 845,000 acres of rainforest habitat. And you can read more about these conservation outcomes in our impact report, which is available on our website. Tonight's webinar will run for approximately 20 minutes. Uh, Alex's present, sorry, 40 minutes. Alex's presentation will run for 20 minutes. And following that, we will have a 15 minute Q&A. So if you have any questions throughout the presentation, please pop them in the chat box and uh, we'll attempt to answer as many of those as we can following the presentation. We would really love to know where you're coming from, where you're joining us from this evening. So if you could also put the country in with your, your question, that would be great. I will now hand you over to Leif Cox, founder of the International Elephant Project, who will introduce Alex. Hi, everybody. Um, it's, it's a great pleasure to um, be here tonight and introduce Alex, and in particular, the launch of his wonderful book, Island Elephants. The, Orang the International Elephant Project is a, a partner with the Orangutan Project and International Tiger Project, a holistic way to save elephants, tigers, and orangutans in their natural habitat. Our vision is that one day all elephants will live in the wild and secure populations. And because no elephant population remaining is sustainable, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of science and a lot of dedication to pull the Sumatran elephant through the extinction crisis. Luckily, we have dedicated, intelligent, and cooperative members of the elephant community, such as Alex Malkenbecker. He exemplifies our values of using science, knowledge, and cooperation, and putting the elephants and the survival of them and the habitat beyond um, personal gain or reputation. So it's a great pleasure that um, we've spent a long time working with Alex, both at supporting his research. He's as a wildlife protection unit manager in the Booker Tickle ecosystem with the Frankfurt Zoological Society, a long-term partner of ours, and now as our field manager, um, coordinating and directing our funds and efforts um, with fantastic, wonderful on-the-ground Indonesian partners to bring back the Sumatran elephant from the brink of extinction and pass on to future generations a sustainable mega population. So without any further ado, I hand it over to the wonderful Alex, who will take you through the key aspects and eventually ending um, with explaining in his book the, the strategy and the, and the plan which, if put in place, will bring um, Sumatran elephants into the next century as a viable species. Thank you very much. Thanks uh, very much, Live, for the introduction and good day, everyone. I hope you're well, wherever you be. Um, before I start my little presentation today, uh, start talking about the book, uh, I would like to thank all the great people that have supported me uh, during the past months, uh, during the, the writing time of the book, uh, by providing photos, for example, information, um, by um, providing advice. And obviously also many uh, people have helped me to review the book, to increase the, um, yeah, the quality of, the, of my writing. 
I would like to highlight uh, here a, a huge shout out to Kali Bulo from IEP TOP, who has um, yeah, made sure that my weird German English is actually put into a proper English that you can enjoy when you purchase the book now. So <clears throat> I will start the presentation now. Sorry for that. Takes a little. So I hope you can see it now, the presentation. So a little information about myself. My name is Alexander Moosbrucker and I was born and raised in Germany. And that's also where I started to study biology and had first my interest into uh, wild uh, animals, all kinds of animals, and uh, they're getting uh, larger. <laughs> they were getting larger every year. Um, I then had a, a few trips to uh, South America, to Central America, studied the semester in Panama, and then ended up studying forestry science in Indonesia at Gajamada University. So <clears throat> in 2008, I started to research elephants. The first time I came into contact with wild elephants in Sumatra. And a few years later, two years later in 2010, I decided to move to Indonesia and founded the Sumatran Elephant Conservation Initiative. In 2012, I joined International Elephant Project, first as a voluntary advisor, and then since early this year, as Live mentioned, I work there as a full-time field manager, supporting our project on the ground. So the past 10 years, I've spent my time, a lot of these guys, the FZS Wildlife Protection Unit, Frankfurt Zoological Society's team on the ground in central Sumatra. And it was during that time uh, where I learned a lot about elephants, about conservation in the tropics, uh, but also about all the challenges that are connected to it. And this time has really shaped me and many of the great experiences that I, um, that I uh, gathered there with, with these guys in the field have made their way into the book. Um, it was also during that time that I came into contact with the Gajamara University Wildlife Conservation Center in Indonesia and started to uh, getting involved in supporting young conservationists. And it was by that time that I realized that conservation without the great people, without local people, motivated, well-educated people is, is just not possible. So if you want to conserve elephants, you have to provide a, a proper um, baseline a proper foundation and these foundation are the people who actually implement the conservation work besides all the work uh, done with local communities somebody has to go out there be motivated to do something for for the natural heritage for for their elephants in the country and <clears throat> that was one of my um, number one motivations i would say to start writing the book to provide um, yeah, a solid basis uh, a compact book for for young conservationists for emerging uh, conservationists to, to get started with elephants. So now let's have a look at the book. The title is Island Elephants, the Giants of Sumatra. And I chose Island Elephants as a title because obviously Sumatran elephants are only found on the island of Sumatra. But other than that, they are also um, in living in fragmented populations. So if you look um, on a map of Sumatra you, and you look at the elephant distribution there, it looks like a lot of small um, island populations, actually. So various populations all isolated from each other. And that's why they are in a double sense island elephants, these Sumatran elephants. The book is, um, um, yeah, the book has four chapters. So it's divided in four chapters. And the first one, I provide a little introduction to elephants. Asian elephants are the focus here, not Africans. And I compile a lot of uh, basic information on elephants um, as a foundation for the for the following chapters. And in chapter two, um, it's all about the Sumatran subspecies, uh, Elephas maximus sumatranus, full on. All the literature, all the publications, all the information I have from friends and colleagues, my own experiences during the time in Sumatra made their way there and that into the book. Um, chapter three is a more technical chapter. There I summarize uh, methodologies, uh, techniques, strategies to monitor and research elephants and specifically Sumatran elephants. It's a little bit different from research other elephants because um, they live in the forest in a dense uh, vegetation where you can't see them properly most of the time. So the, the 
um, research methodologies are, have to be specifically, the methods have to be specifically adapted to that environment. I also summarize all the um, research that is out there about Sumatran elephants or uh, all that I could uh, get hold on and provide therefore a, a solid a baseline for, for people who are interested in conducting their own research and, and monitoring um, tasks. Then finally in chapter four, um, we're getting to the core of it, the management and conservation. Obviously, conservation has to be site specific, so I only can provide there a basic uh, strategy, an outline of the strategy and introduce uh, several methods and uh, detail go into details of these methods that can be applied in the field to protect and conserve elephants. So other than the young conservationists that have motivated me to write the book, um, one of my motivations was uh, a little bit selfish because I I am really fascinated about elephants. I think they're really amazing animals and uh, the book gave me also the chance uh, during this corona time to do my uh, own uh, desktop research again, to dig a little bit deeper in several topics and, and go into details. And uh, it's, they just fascinate me for such a long time and they keep amazing me, uh, keep amazing me. So <clears throat> to understand elephants, you have to start um, with their foundation, the foundation of their society, which is family. So elephants live in uh, small female groups, um, all related um, females, uh, grandmothers, their offspring, the aunties, the, um, the siblings, all these females live most of their life uh, in the same group. And overall, if you encounter elephants in the field, it can be that you encounter several groups, several, several such, such family groups joining into larger herds, or sometimes you also call them clans. So they have a fish and fusion society where the core of these small family groups can join with others, form larger agglomerations, and then roam around for several weeks, several months, sometimes even years. Eventually they will break off again and restructure. A little bit different, it's with the bulls. The male elephants, they usually leave these family groups once they grow older, once they reaching adulthood. During puberty, they uh, increasingly um, separate themselves from their natal herds and then start to disperse, start to explore new areas and um, eventually um, settle down in an area where there are unrelated females. This is called dispersal. And the natural function is, uh, of that mechanism is, is to, um, yeah, it's a, it's a very effective mechanism to prevent inbreeding um, and to spread the gains over the landscape. Elephants also amaze me because of their mental abilities. Uh, some researchers say they are on par almost uh, with uh, chimpanzees and other uh, great apes and, uh, and the cetaceans in the, in, the, in the ocean, the whales and the dolphins. So what we know, they have uh, huge and uh, very complex structures, brains uh, with, a, with a large neocortex. Um, so we know they are very intelligent. They have excellent memory. They needed also this excellent memory because they have to remember all the different pathways and uh, all the different feeding spots and, and feeding areas in their home range, but also all the, mem the members of the elephant society which they sometimes not encounter every day, but maybe have to remember for years. Uh, we also know that they actually can remember keepers and, and other persons they have spent time with in captivity for, for years and end. And uh, this is a really, really an amazing um, capability. So we also know that they are self-aware or there are experiments that prove that and they are good at spontaneous problem solving as well. Um, there's proof uh, enough that they are able to do complex cooperation tasks there is uh, observations of simple tool use, and we also know that they show empathy. It's a little bit different to other animals. If you want to research elephants, most of the um, work um, in the past has been done with primates, and they are, these primates are very similar to us, but um, elephants obviously live in a very different sensory world where the sense of hearing and the sense of smell is, might be much more important than, for example, the sense of uh, vision, the so vision sense. So that's why experiments have to be adapted um, very specifically for, for elephants. They're also very powerful. You can't put them easily in an experiment if they don't want to. So, um, yeah, but proof is, uh, is increasing scientific proof uh, about what we know already that they have these amazing mental abilities. Another great feature of elephants is that they roam over very large areas, which seems to be a disadvantage at times because then you need also 
to protect large areas, but, but with these um, large forest ecosystems that you protect, if you want to protect elephants, you also automatically conserve, protect all the other species that live in this habitat. That's why we call elephants also an umbrella species. And they are, that makes them the perfect flagship species also for ecosystem conservation. So by conserving the elephants, we conserve their habitat. And with their habitat, we conserve all the other amazing species that live there. Tigers, other mammals, trees, various kinds of plants. So the whole biodiversity. Um, elephants are also good at seed dispersal. And we often call them ecosystem engineer because they are powerful, large enough to actually shape their environment. They can keep it open, open up areas, and that uh, increases the level of biodiversity in the areas where elephant, uh, elephants actually live. Sumatran elephants, they are a subspecies of the Asian elephant called Elephas maximus sumatranus in um, the scientific language. They are very unique animals, for example, uh, morphologically and anatomically unique. They are much smaller than most other subspecies together with the Bornean elephant. They are considered the smallest elephant in the world. They also look a little bit different than others. They have less depigmented um, uh, skin. Most of the bulls have tusks, actually not all, but many. And they are also very um, different from all the other subspecies uh, if you look at the genetics. They've been isolated for many thousands of years since the last ice age and then developed into something very special on the island. Unfortunately, there are less than 1,500 uh, Sumatran elephants remaining in the wild. Um, it could be even that there are less than 1,000, so we don't know for all areas the exact numbers. And it might be that they're, they're much less than we actually believe, hopefully not. But yeah, the population service in the future will show that. Um, the main threats, the reasons for their population decline is um, the habitat destruction. That's the number one. And resulting from habitat destruction, the conflict with the human population. Poaching is also still a problem uh, in Asian elephants that mostly, mostly the bulls are targeted because of their tusks. Females have no tusks. They have tushes, smaller ones. Um, but that also increases the, the problems that are anyway already there. Due to the small population size, there is already a large, um, a huge risk of inbreeding and therefore the loss of genetic diversity. And by poaching the bulls, you increase this risk dramatically. So overall, based on all the threats that the Sumatran elephants are facing, they are listed as critically endangered by the IUCN. And yeah, that makes them really, really uh, one of the most uh, uh, endangered, um, threatened elephants in the world. They are one step away from being extinct in the wild, and it's really time that we change that, that we do something. In the book, I outline also the conservation strategy, as I said in the last chapter. And while I don't, I don't um, have the time now to go into details, but overall, the conservation strategy has two levels. The one is the local level, where you deploy, for example, anti-poaching patrols, ranger patrols that protect um, elephants directly in the field. You work with local communities on human elephant conflict mitigation. That's a very important um, component in almost all projects. Um, only by providing safety uh, to farmers and their livelihood and to their families can you assure that over the long term you can um, conserve, keep elephants in a certain um, environment. Then number three is a mandatory component of all the projects, uh, habitat conservation and where it's necessary. And that's unfortunately many areas, also the habitat restoration. <clears throat> the next level of conservation, the higher level is on the island level on the scale of the island. In the middle, you can see a map of Sumatra and I highlighted there several subpopulations of Sumatran elephants. So you have to think of like, the Sumatran elephant doesn't live in one large population with 1,500 animals, but in contrast, it's, frag it's a fragmented population. So there are many smaller, um, smaller populations that are distributed over the islands, and there are usually less than 200 animals per population, per subpopulation, and they're isolated from each other. So in most cases, the elephants are not able to um, disperse, for example, or to um, to move from one area to the other. There's so much 
agriculture areas, cities, roads, other obstacles in between that it's not possible. So one way to deal with it, because obviously the isolation and therefore the, the um, high levels of uh, the, the high risk of inbreeding and the, the risk of the genetic loss is threatening the elephants over the long term. So the, the way to deal with this is, um, is to implement a meta population management concept. And that means that all these little subpopulation can be connected to each other. And that's done, for example, by translocating elephants, as you can see in the left picture, where a dispersal bull that is anyway ready to go somewhere else to look for a new place where this bull is captured and then translocated to a new area where he can spread the, the genes and assure that these um, subpopulations are genetically connected. In some areas, in a few areas, you can also uh, create corridors where they can just move along. But as I said before, in many areas, it's not possible. In the future, it might be also an option to release some of the captive held elephants to introduce new genes, but that's currently not practiced in Indonesia. So for now, I think we're good. I can't tell you all about what I've written in the book. Um, I highly advise to read it if you're more, if you're, uh, more interested in it. And um, yeah, you can now ask me all the questions you have. I'm very thankful that you joined us and I hope that you stay on a little bit and that we can have a, a fruitful, interesting discussion now. Thank you very much. Great. Well, thanks, Alex, for, for your uh, fantastic presentation and, and for sharing your passion um, with the Sumatran elephant. Um, we have some great questions that have come through, so we're going to delve um, straight into those. And uh, firstly, we have Sean, who's asked um, how much of the elephant's current habitat is unprotected forest um, that is not in a national park or under permanent protection, and how much of the current habitat could potentially be cleared in the future? That's uh, lots of questions, actually, <laughs> and good <laughs> questions. I think so. What we believe is that about 80% of the elephants live outside protected areas. So that means that quite a large number actually of elephants don't live in national parks. And um, yeah, I think that at least half of that, of these 80%, could become protected areas in the future. Uh, Laurie uh, asks, what sort of activities do your field agents do to protect elephants in their, ter in their territory? And is walking through the territory enough of a deterrent to poachers? Yeah, not always. Yeah. So, I mean, obviously, if you, if you implement, if you're on location, um, then you dramatically decrease already the, the, um, the likelihood that illegal activities happen. But there needs also to be law enforcement that cannot be done by NGOs in, in Indonesia. So there's also the need to cooperate with the local police. Um, another big um, step or um, a very important step is to do education and awareness activities, uh, because most people, they, they actually, if they understand the issues, they, they actually don't want to, to uh, commit any crimes. Obviously, the real criminals who are after ivory or uh, try to kill elephants, these you have to do with law enforcement. But for example, encroachment issues or so you often can do, uh, you can resolve with uh, education programs. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, Bruce has asked, uh, when you say the Sumatran elephant is the smallest of the subspecies, how small are they? Okay, so often the Bornean elephant is considered the smallest, but um, then research shows that the Bornean and the Sumatran subspecies are about the same size. So we can say, um, yeah, plus minus, uh, both are, are the smallest uh, ones out there, still alive. There used to be dwarf elephants actually in the Mediterranean and also in Sulawesi, but that's already a long, long time ago and they are extinct now. And so nowadays the Bornean and the Sumatran elephants are the smallest. So we can say that um, a small female elephant of the Sumatran subspecies is about 1 meter 80 at the shoulder. Um, often they are a little bit larger, two meter to twenty at the shoulder, can weigh two to three, three and a half tons. Bulls might be from two to twenty, uh, two twenty at the shoulder to two, maybe two and a half meter, and might be four tons or even more. So they're still quite big animals, actually. Okay, uh, Vicky has asked, how many elephants uh, usually form a herd? How many elephants form a herd? Mm -hmm. uh, so yeah, typically. So the, the, the smallest, I mean, the, everything from two to, <laughs> I would say, 60 is possible to, um, to meet in the field. 
but then uh, the core, the family group is usually around 10 to 15. And then uh, what often happens is that they uh, join other family groups and then form much larger herds of maybe 20, 30, but sometimes we even see 60 animals in one group. So that's also possible. So it varies. Uh, sorry. <laughs> uh, Sheik has asked, uh, to what degree are multinational companies uh, such as uh, palm plantations helping with elephant habitat conservation? Yeah, so <clears throat> that's a little bit of a difficult question. Um, some companies, they do have conservation areas, which is uh, great. Um, they also, all of the companies, at least in, in Sumatra and Indonesia, are obliged actually to have conservation, to allocate um, a part of the concession to conservation areas. But in reality, the case is often that these areas that are allocated for conservation are encroached. So that means that on paper, it's a, it's a protected area, but then uh, it's, it's an oil palm or something else. So it really very much depends. There are good examples, but then there are also many bad examples. Well, we have another question from Vicky. Um, she's asked, uh, what kind of education do you provide to, um, oh, sorry, I've just lost her question. Where did it go? <laughs> what kind of education do you provide to communities to help stop conflict and poaching? And um, what information do people uh, need to help change their relationship with elephants? Well, uh, say the second part. I didn't uh, the second it. part was what information do people need to help change their relationship with the elephant? Okay, so for most local communities, for, for farmers, it's it's mostly about the livelihood. So um, what you have to do is you have to educate them how to protect their livelihood without um, necessarily putting elephants or themselves at risk. Yeah? So that's the number one. So how to stay safe around elephants, that's very important. And then also how to protect the fields from elephant raids without um, hurting, injuring, killing the elephants. That's that's the number one that we have to do. Once the local communities are safe, so their livelihood is safe and the elephants are safe as well, we have already reached our main goal. But then obviously there are second or third stages where we go more into detail, for example, providing alternative livelihood, we educate people or provide examples how they could maybe change uh, their way of life to live more in harmony with the environment. In some areas, um, people do that very well. Mostly that's local native people that live there since centuries or thousands of years. In other areas where people from other islands come there, transmigrants, so new arrivals that are not used to live in forests, there you have to put in a little bit more effort to make them yeah, live in, in harmony again with the forest. Mm -hmm. uh, Carol's asked, um, uh, what is the level of government government support for, for conservation activities? So in all areas, there's um, um, obviously a wildlife authority that is patrolling the forest and also doing all the work and all the projects that we support and also my project where I've worked uh, the past years is also in cooperation with the local government. So it's, the government is not just involved, but they are the leaders actually in the field. And the role of the NGOs is to support the government in that. Unfortunately, the government does not always have the funds and also the, the personal capacity to, in, to implement the work properly. So that's where, where the, the, the strong role of the NGOs is to fill these gaps to help the government to, to, to reach their goals uh, in conservation. Uh, we have a question from Cheryl. Uh, she's asked, what is an ethical way of visiting elephants in Indonesia or other countries without exploiting them? Yeah, that's uh, sometimes a little bit different, uh, difficult because when you arrive maybe in Bali or so, you, you will um, most often be lured into one of the tourist traps where it's all about um, a quick uh, one hour um, yeah, thing that you can wash an elephant, ride on an elephant or something, but it has nothing to do with conservation in most cases. Uh, um, there are ethical ways like doing, for example, a jungle trip with a, with a proper guide um, that really supports local communities in these locations where the elephants live. Um, another way would be, for example, to join something like uh, life, uh, Life's um, uh, tours that he's conducting. Um, so that's certainly a, a very ethical way to to enjoy the forest 
And I think we'll have one more question um, from Vicky again. Um, she's asked, is it possible to restore enough forests that some of the islands, uh, the islands um, are linked up through forest corridors? Yeah, so in some areas it is possible. In the northern part of Sumatra, for example, we are involved in a project where uh, a local NGO and a local company that is uh, founded by, by uh, an NGO is actually involved in doing exactly that. So, um, yeah, restoring and protecting key areas for elephants and other large wild, wildlife. Great. In most uh, well, sorry, I add sorry. in most places, unfortunately, it's not possible. Yeah, so there are many areas where the where the distance is just too too uh, large. Yeah? When you have more than a hundred or two hundred square um, um, kilometers in between the, the populations, and there are cities and markets and roads and highways in between, it's not possible. All right, uh, Sheikh has uh, uh, put in one last question. <laughs> Snuck one in. Um, what is the big challenge you have in undertaking your research? Oh, so many challenges, yeah. <laughs> but I, I have to say, I like challenges, so that's why it's not a bad thing in in, in per se. Yeah? But um, yeah, if you yeah, if you're thrown into a completely new, I think the first really big challenge was the language. When I arrived in Indonesia the first time, I couldn't understand the people, and they um, yeah, my English was not perfect, but their English was just not existent. So we had to find a way to to communicate, and I. I quickly learned the language. It's not so complicated for Germans, but it took me quite a while. So that was the, the biggest uh, number one in the beginning. And then uh, so many other things. <laughs> so, so if you're not used to work in the tropics, you can get sick. Uh, I got malaria, dengue, all kinds of things. So that it's always um, yeah, not planned, but uh, happens. Um, yeah, over time, you get used to, to the work there and it's getting better. Great. Well, thanks everybody for um, such fantastic questions and, and thanks again, Alex, for your fantastic presentation. Um, and it was really great to hear about the work that you and your team are doing on the ground to protect and conserve um, the Sumatran elephant. Um, if you'd like to purchase a copy of Alex's book, you can do so um, through our website at uh, www.internationalelephantproject.org. Um, and uh, before you go, we also wanted you to be the first to hear of an exciting new tour that's running next year between the 21st and 30th of October. So in conjunction with Orangutan Odysseys, uh, we'll be running a 10 day elephant tour in Laos uh, with Alex as chaperone, who will be providing some insights into elephant conservation. Um, the tour will start and end in Bangkok and the highlight will be a visit uh, to see the work being done by the Elephant Conservation Centre um, in rehabilitating elephants and releasing them back into the wild. So further details are again on our website, but you can also head straight to um, www.orangutanodysseys.com. So thanks again, everybody, for joining us today and for supporting the work of the International Elephant Project. Thank you, Alex. Thank you, Aaron. Thank, Thank you. Everybody. Bye. Good night.